Well, good morning. If you and I don't know one another, my name is Matthew Perez. I'm one of the elders here at Life Church. It's a pleasure to open the Word of God. I'm going to be in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 11. I want to encourage you to follow along. If you have a Bible, I'm in the ESV. If you have a tablet or phone, we encourage you to do that. If you don't own a Bible, uh, when you head out today, or even do it right now, just out those doors, you're going to find our connection table. There's Bibles there that are our gift to you. We open God's Word each week. We let God's Word shape us. We let God's Word challenge us, and we walk through it verse by verse. And so if you don't own a copy of God's Word, we definitely want you to have a copy. We're going to be in the Gospel of Mark chapter 11 this morning in verses 11 through 25. Before we get there, I want us to pause and realize that our passage this morning is one that through the years has troubled many people. Uh, Noted atheist, the late Bertrand Russell, who was a mathematician, philosopher, and atheist who wrote the book, Why I Am Not a Christian, actually uses this passage, among others, to point to why he does not believe in Jesus Christ. He says his passage this morning in which Jesus is going to curse a fig tree that is healthy and then withers and dies, he calls it, quote, vindictive fury on an innocent plant. And he says it troubled him that this type of behavior would be manifested by someone who people think is the son of God, and this isn't even someone who'd be righteous to just show such vindictive fury on an innocent plant. And lest you think I'm just throwing an atheist under the bus, it's also noted that there are many Christian scholars who will struggle with this passage as well. Uh, Some have called it an abuse of supernatural power and think it was a waste of an act that Jesus would do this. It is one of only two miracles in which I would call them destructive, right? Like, when we think of miracles that Jesus performs, there's blind people that can now see, there's lame people that can now walk, there's lepers that are healed, dead come to life. There's two times, though, where something destructive happens, right? Earlier in Mark chapter 5, Jesus uh, comes across a man who is um, possessed by evil spirits, and he casts the demons out of the man and into a herd of pigs, and those pigs run off a cliff into the water and drown themselves. That passage in this one here, in which there is a tree that we're told is a fig tree in leaf that appears to be healthy, Jesus will curse it, and the next day it'll be withered and die. They're the only two times that we see uh, Jesus perform a miracle in which something is what I would call destroyed. And on the surface, it, it looks to some like an abuse of power, or this senseless act, or as uh, Russell said, vindictive fury, and it's actually an enacted parable in which Jesus is going to use the fig tree to teach us something. You see, the, the fig tree is going to be cursed, and then it's going to die, and in between, sandwiched in between, is going to be Jesus going in the temple to, as some would call it, cleanse it. I would say he's actually condemning it, and it very much goes with this enacted parable of this fig tree. In our passage this morning, we're going to see Jesus pronounce a judgment on this unfruitful fig tree, and it's actually a picture of God's judgment on an unfruitful temple, right? He's going to come to this tree expecting to find fruit, and it's going to be barren. No different than God's people that are expected to be bearing fruit in the temple, and they're also going to be barren, and those two things are going to be tied together. It's a passage in which God is going to show us that like religious performance, religious legalism, religious just external action with no heart change is actually judged and condemned by God. He puts on, uh, he, he judges those who will put on a show religiously, those who will say the things that need to be said and do the things that need to be done to give the appearance that they are good people or religious people and yet their hearts are going to be far from God, producing no fruit and in no way honoring God. That's what we're going to see this morning in our passage. I'm going to begin reading in verse 11 of Mark chapter 11 and we're going to go through verse 25. Join me in the text. And he, he is Jesus, right? And he entered Jerusalem 
and went into the temple. And he looked around at everything, and as it was already late. He went out to Bethany with the twelve. On the following day, when they came from Bethany, he was hungry. And seeing in the distance a fig tree in leaf, he went to see if he could find anything on it. When he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. And he said to it, May no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard it. And they came to Jerusalem. And he entered the temple and began to drive out those who sold and those who bought in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. And he would not allow anyone to carry anything through the temple. And he was teaching them and saying to them, Is it not written, My house shall be called a house of prayer for all the nations, a passage we saw earlier. But you have made it a den of robbers. And the chief priests and the scribes heard it and were seeking a way to destroy him, for they feared him, because all the crowd was astonished at his teaching. And when evening came, they went out of the city, and they passed by in the morning. They saw the fig tree withered away to its roots. And Peter remembered and said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree that you cursed has withered. And Jesus answered them, Have faith in God. Truly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says will come to pass, it will be done for him. Therefore I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you have received it, and it will be yours. And whatever, whenever you stand praying, forgive, if you have anything against anyone, so that your Father also who is in heaven may forgive you your trespasses. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning for the opportunity we have to gather together to open the Word of God, to sit under the authority of your Word, to allow it to shape our hearts and our heads and our hands. Lord, I pray for us this morning as we open your Word, as well as praying for other churches in our county this morning. I pray that each of us, as your people, would sit under the authority of your Word allowing it to challenge and shape. Lord, I pray not only for me, but for the other individuals in pulpits this morning in our county, that we would be faithful to your word, that we would speak your truth, and that the words that we share would be honoring and glorifying to you. Lord, we pray for our church this morning, as well as churches in our county, that our words would not just be a religious exercise, but instead that we would look to be molded, shaped and challenged, and respond appropriately to your word. We pray this in your son's name. Amen. I want us to think about the flow of this passage this morning. It, it works kind of like a sandwich, right? There's going to be a a couple pieces of bread, right? The, the fig tree is cursed and the fig tree withers and in between is the filling of your choice. It's the temple being uh, cleansed or condemned. And then there's this thing on prayer that seems kind of funky, like how does it fit in? And I, I would actually say like think of like today's passage, like a plate, you've got your sandwich and you've got like the chips on the side that like complement the sandwich really well. And it seems like, like Jesus takes this left turn about prayer, yet it's going to complement very well the passage that we're looking at this morning in the fig tree and with the temple. Let's start by thinking about the fig tree that is cursed, right? Let's think about our setting. Let's get our bearings, right? In verse 11, Jesus has entered Jerusalem. If you were here with us last week, it was a, a what we would call today Palm Sunday, right? Jesus comes in and people are excited. They're crying out, Hosanna, save now. And, and there's a, just this big fury and excitement as Jesus enters Jerusalem he goes and walks into the temple, he looks around, and then he leaves. He heads to, we're told in verse 11, Bethany. So he takes about a 30-minute walk, maybe a 45-minute walk. And, and then the next morning, Jesus and the disciples get up, and they're now heading back to Jerusalem. And we're told on the way that a fig tree is spotted, and we're told in verse 13 that it is in leaf. But nothing is on it, because it's not fig season. Now, I'm not a fig expert, but I know how to read, so I studied up on figs. So like, okay, what's going on here? Right? So fig season is, is going to be late summer, early fall, like 
end of August to about this time of the year. You get to enjoy that fruit and then the, the figs are done and from there these buds start to sprout through the winter on your fig tree and then you get these little like knops that start to form in the late uh, winter, early spring and then the tree leaves. And so if you have this tree that has leaves on it, you also have these knops on it. They're not quite fully developed figs, but they are edible and people would eat them. And so if you're walking and you see a fig tree that is in leaf, it should have something on it. And from afar, the tree looks good, but it's far from good, right? When Jesus approaches it, there's nothing on it. The tree has been deceptive. Upon closer inspection, it's barren. It's not producing, although it gives the appearance that it should Now, before we jump to the temple, there's a couple things we need to consider. One is that this tree that is in leaf is barren. But the other thing we have to consider is the type of tree. Because when I first read this, I'm like, it's just a tree that should have figs on it. Like, he could have had an orange tree or an apple tree or a lemon tree. But that's really not the case. The type of tree also matters. This is a fig tree. And it's a fig tree that is not producing. Why does that matter? Well, because on like five different occasions in the Old Testament, God's word uses the imagery of the fig tree to pronounce judgment when there's disobedience to God's word. You're going to see a couple of passages on the screen behind me. You don't, you don't have to turn there, but if you'd like to take notes, you can take some notes and look at these later on, right? In Isaiah 34 We're told that the nations are going to be judged by the Lord and they will fall like leaves falling from a fig tree. In Jeremiah chapter 29, God's word tells us that judgment is coming to God's people. They're going to be like vile, rotten figs that cannot be eaten. Why? Because they're not listening to And they're not responding to God's commandments, to God's word. So judgment is coming. It's it's in Hosea chapter 2 as well, right? God's people are told judgment is coming because you're running after other gods. And God's going to lay waste to your vines and to your figs is what we're told in Hosea chapter 2. Joel talks about this in Joel chapter 1 verses 1 through 12. Joel tells us judgment is coming for God's people, for their disobedience. They're going to be like a fig tree that's just split in half because they've been disobedient to the Word of God and their figs aren't going to produce. This tree's just going to languish and die. Micah chapter 7 will also talk about this concept where Micah 7 says the figs are not producing because God's people have been disobedient. They've been evil. And we're waiting on salvation from God. Right, like when I first read Mark chapter 11, I just, it, 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 at first appearance feel, feels like God's just walking by, Jesus is walking by this tree that's not producing fruit, but this isn't just any random tree. It's a tree that God's word has used continually to say, judgment is coming for those who don't respond properly to the word of God. This isn't just some random tree. This isn't a moment where Jesus got hangry, Right? My oldest brother laughs still to this day when he was a house guest with me and my parents up in Alaska several years ago, and and my mom was out running errands, and I said to my brother, Sean, I said, Mom doesn't understand that if Matt doesn't eat by six, Matt gets kind of angry and surly. We've got to figure this out, right? This isn't Jesus like getting angry and surly because dinner time is late. Jesus curses a tree that has been used throughout God's word to display that judgment is coming to God's people for their failure to walk in obedience to his word. And then in verse 14, we're told he enters Jerusalem and he enters the temple. Let's stop right there and get our bearings. You think about the temple, think about just this giant big square that is like fenced in by stone wall, and when you first walk in, you walk into an area known as the Court of Gentiles. Why is it called that? 
Let's remember a, a Gentile in God's word is just somebody who is of a non-Jewish background, right? You're of a non-Jewish background and you have converted. You are now one of God's people. You're allowed to go into the temple and you're allowed to worship God, but you're only allowed to go into this area known as the court of Gentiles. So if you're of a non-Jewish background, you're allowed access to the temple to come and worship God, but you're only allowed to go into certain places of the temple. In fact, there's signage that is very clear that if you are not Jewish, you are not to go beyond this point. So this is the only place that someone of a non-Jewish background can go if they want to come to the temple to worship and reflect and celebrate God's goodness. It's the only place they can go. And it's a wild scene. Because in this area... Animals are being sold. Sheep, doves. Why would you sell animals in the temple? Like, let's remember, you go to the temple, you're going to bring a sacrifice, and you bring a good sacrifice. I, I live like a mile from Food Lion. I get nervous just taking eggs home from Food Lion. Like, I couldn't imagine having to bring like a, a sheep or a lamb or some kind of animal on like a four or five day journey. Worrying about, like, am I going to damage it? Is it going to, like, get hurt or broken or lost? So, so I, I tend to think this started out as a good thing. Hey, man, like, we'll provide some animals for you. Just come and buy them. The unfortunate thing is, somewhere along the ways, this gets corrupted because that's what we do. You can buy an animal now in the temple, but it's going to come with a hefty markup. You may bring your animal, and they're going to inspect it to see if anything's wrong, because if something's wrong with it, if it's defective, you're going to have to buy one of our animals. Guess what? It's always defective. I'm from Chicago, like the land of El Capone. Like, this is like an El Capone-like racket in God's house. No, El Capone wasn't a good dude, but he's like a legend in Chicago. Because not only are we selling you animals, but if you want to buy an animal, you need our money. Hey, don't worry if you don't have our money. We have a currency exchange right over here with a hefty markup for an exchange rate. And all of this is being run by the Sadducees, right? All this, this is big business. All being run by the religious leaders. The historian, the Jewish historian Josephus said that in the year 66, which is like 30 plus years from now, right? Jesus is in here in in Passover you know, early, mid-30s, and now about 30 years later, Josephus said, just in the year 66, during just Passover week alone, it was estimated that over 250,000 lambs were sold in the market in one week alone. That's, that's a lot. This is supposed to be a place of worship, and it's loud, and it's confusing, And it's busy, business is going on, bartering might be going on, money's changing hands, animals are screaming and yelling and smelling and doing what animals do after they eat. It's supposed to be where they're worshiping. Have you ever seen videos or pictures of like Wall Street or the New York Stock Exchange where people are buying and selling commodities. It's a wild scene. Just imagine throwing a couple thousand animals into the midst of it. You got chaos. Not exactly a place for Gentiles to reflect, to pray, and to worship. And the Jewish community is actually okay with this because they believe when Messiah comes, he's actually going to drive the Gentiles out of the temple. So they, they don't mind doing this. And here comes Jesus, and he's not driving out the Gentiles. He's actually advocating for them, and he just cleans house. Talk about chaotic. Money tables being overturned, coins hitting the the pavement and clinging and clanging, animals getting shoved out. This is not going to go unnoticed. And when all of the chaos has subsided, Jesus begins to teach. And Mark gives us part of that, where Jesus says in verse 17, Is it not written, My house shall be called the house of prayer for all the nations, but you have made it a den of robbers. These are actually two different quotes from two different passages. 
Let's look at the first one. My house shall be called the house of prayer for all the nations. We actually saw that earlier during our worship setting and song and in the reading of the word when, when Jonathan led us and, and quoted from this passage. It's from Isaiah chapter 56, verse 7. In Isaiah chapter 56, we're told salvation is coming and that it's coming, so walk in obedience. And then in Isaiah 56, verse 3, we're told if you're a foreigner, right, you're a Gentile, you're a non-Jew, don't think that God is going to separate you out when he comes. He's not going to remove you from his kingdom when he comes. He's going to bring you to his holy mountain and your offerings and sacrifices will be accepted because yours, the house is a house of prayer for all nations, is what Isaiah 56 tells us. In fact, in verse 6 and 7, it says, And the foreigners, that would be a Gentile, who joined themselves to the Lord to minister to him, to love the name of the Lord, and to be his servants, everyone who keeps the Sabbath and does not profane it and holds fast my covenant, these I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be accepted at my altar. For my house shall be called the house of prayer for all peoples. This is what God's temple was to be. God's people, God's kingdom is a place where people from every tongue and tribe and nation are, are welcomed. It's the beauty of his kingdom that you're not welcomed in because of the color of your skin. You're not welcomed in because of the nationality that you are. And you're not excluded because of the color of your skin. And you're not excluded because of the nationality that you are. You're brought into the kingdom only through the grace of God through Jesus Christ. And we praise and we celebrate that. And he says here, my kingdom is to be for all people. But there's a problem, he says. You have made it a den of robbers. He's now quoting from Jeremiah chapter 7, verse 11. In Jeremiah chapter 7, we're told that God's people are to amend their ways. They're to repent before they come to the temple. That's the concept of Jeremiah 7. He says, repent. And actually in Jeremiah 7, he says, protect those who don't have a voice. And included in that list of people are foreigners, Gentiles. He says, protect them. Pre repent. Come into the temple, don't chase after other gods, don't chase after greed, don't go on, Jeremiah 7 says, continually sinning, continually disobeying God, and then stroll into the temple and celebrate your salvation in Him. That's what Jeremiah 7 is about. He says, don't go walking around in continual sin, and continual disobedience to the Word of God, and then stroll into church and act like I'm just really excited for what God has done for me. He says, when you do that, Jeremiah 7, 11, has this house which is called by my name become a den of robbers in your eyes? Behold, I myself have seen it, declares the Lord. He says, this will not be a place where you walk in and celebrate your deliverance and then walk out and just walk in continual habitual sin. You're robbing God of the glory and honor that is due him. You're a thief. Jesus says this temple is a representation of God's kingdom, which all are welcome. And your continual sin, and then coming to worship God like it's no big deal. You're called to represent and worship and honor Him. The temple is really busy, and it's given the appearance of a lot of good religious stuff that's going on. And yet they're being condemned by Christ because their love for God and their hearts to God are far from Him. They're kind of like a fig tree and leaf that looks really good from afar, but it's far from good because on closer inspection, there is nothing there. When you examine that tree more closely, it's empty. Does God say the same about us when he examines our life more closely? The religious leaders are incensed. Jesus leaves, no pun intended. The next day, verse 19, he's walking by the fig tree. Peter, ever so observant, hey look, the tree that you cursed is withered, it's, it's dead. It's a bookend to the temple. It's dead. It's dead. 
There's nothing there. There's no life. The temple was supposed to be a place where all can worship God, and God's people are very, very, very busy with religious activity. And that activity is actually preventing from real, true worship of God. Fig tree is just God's judgment that is coming on something that gives the appearance of something that is not. The leaves are showing, but there's no fruit. I wonder what God would say about our church's big C today. And we can be really, really busy. We join committees, we sing songs, busy lobby, we can collect goods for the community, we can serve, we can welcome, we can smile. We could give a lot of appearance of just doing really good religious stuff. Are we a bearing fruit? In keeping with repentance, are we walking in obedience to his word? Are we submitting to his word? We can be very busy in church activity without any real heart change or compassion for others. And your hands might be busy doing things for God. I would argue sometimes we're doing them for us. Does he have your heart? You surrendered it to him. Are you more concerned with doing things for him or with walking in obedience to what he's calling you to be? As I think through this, a couple things I want us to stop and think about. Like, especially in America, man, today, we really like Jesus as our Savior. We don't want to think about him as our judge. And this parable reminds us that he is both. That all of the world is going to be judged by him and through him. God's word is very clear on this. And if you're taking refuge in what you're doing, if you're taking refuge in like the things that you think are impressing God, really take some time to think about Mark 11 and ask yourself, Does God have my heart, and is it producing the fruit out of obedience to him? Don't lull yourself into this false belief that God is pleased with you by what you do. And man, church folk can be busy doing a lot of doing. And if you're not careful, you're going to put your stock in that as if that's what makes God impressed with you or your neighbor. You're accepted by God, not by what you do, but what Christ has done at the cross. And if you're here today and you're, you're putting your stock in like I'm a good person, you're putting your stock in like I, I, I'm a nice guy, I'm a good neighbor, I'm a good moral individual, like, I just want to like implore you to see the truth of God's word and that apart from Christ, we all are like this fig tree destined to destruction. And I would implore you to be reconciled to God in Christ. And if you don't know what that means, like talk to somebody you came with, grab somebody with a badge, set up some time for us to talk with you. We would love to talk about what it means to be reconciled to Christ. It's only through Christ that we have any right standing with God. The second way which I'm really challenged by this passage is we sometimes like look at this passage and we like, oh man, that poor fig tree. Man, don't weep over a fig tree, man. It's a tree. And if you're a Greenpeace person, I'm not trying to be like a jerk. It's a tree. Like, weep over people. Like, people who weep over this passage are like that poor tree. I'm like, you're like Jonah. Like, you're really like Jonah. And I, I, I've been challenged by, like, where am I like Jonah in this when it comes to people, right? Like, Jonah, go to Nineveh. And preach to God, preach to the Ninevites that, that God's judgment is coming if they don't repent. No, nah, I don't want to do that. I'll go run the other way. I jump in the water, big fish swallows me, big fish spits me up on the land. God says, Go to Nineveh. All right, I'll go. I preach. Then I walk up on the hill. I'm Jonah, and I sit on the hillside and I wait. Because I think I just really want to see if God's going to bring that judgment. And I hope He does. And as I sit on this hot mountainside and I'm waiting to 
big plant grows up and gives me shade, and I'm just really thankful for the shade, and that plant then dies the next day like this tree, and then I'm Joan on the side crying about that tree. Oh, God, why'd you break my plant? And God's like, dude, you care about that stupid plant. You don't care about like, like thousands of people in Nineveh that don't know me. Like, are you weeping over stuff and programs and things instead of people? Like, weep for the lost. Weep for dead churches in our country that week in and week out are extremely busy with dead hearts. If you spent five minutes with my wife and you asked her, like, what, is, what, what, what breaks your husband's heart the most? Like, I, I weep for lost people. I weep for my lost neighbors. Like, I weep more in the last two years for the church, Big C. Especially in America. Because we're so wrapped up in stuff. We're so wrapped up in politics. We're so wrapped up in busyness. And a lot of times I feel like Big C Church in America is like, we're going to do religious stuff and our hearts are just far from you. And we're like this barren fig tree. It breaks my heart. Charles Spurgeon captured that well in his sermon called Nothing But Leaves. Now, here's the thing, if you know anything about Charles Spurgeon. Charles Spurgeon's been dead for a long time. Charles Spurgeon wrote a sermon called Nothing But Leaves in 1864. So hey, we're talking like 100, almost 60 years ago. And he said, our churches today, this was in 1864. He says, our churches today are like fruitless temples. He says, we have people who are high professing in Christ, but they don't display fruit. People who go to church, but they only worship God with their lips. People who are full of Bible knowledge, they just don't have any heart for God. People who regret over their sin, but they never really repent of it. People who like to talk about God, but they never surrender their heart. I was like, oh, dude, Spurgeon, I don't know what you'd say today. Because I thought you were writing about 2023, not 1864. Repent. It's time we as a church repent of the religious activities that we can be busy in with our hearts just so, so far from God. And then this passage seems like it takes this weird left turn. Jesus starts talking about prayer and like, hey, let's throw some mountains into a sea and what's going on here? It seems at first like this weird twist, but it's not. It complements this section very well. Remember verse 17, my house is to be a house of prayer. <laughs> Jesus says, let's talk about prayer and why it matters. He says, have faith in God, verse 22. Prayer, he ties to faith. Not just a faith in whatever works for you, but the object of your faith matters. And he says, your faith is in God. And he says, you just saw a tremendous display of God's power. He withered a fig tree overnight. And this is the power that's at the disposal when you act in faith, to walk in faith, a faith that asks God to do the impossible, like throw a mountain into the sea. He's not talking literally, but figuratively. He's calling us to, in faith, pray boldly and confidently for him to work in very bold manners. I don't need you to throw a mountain in the sea, but man, you can certainly change the heart of my neighbor, my spouse, my child, of me. Are you praying that boldly for the lost people in your life? He calls us to rest in him. Therefore, I tell you, verse 24, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you have and received it and it will be yours. This is not a like, man, just pray and you'll get it. But it's talking about a life that is rooted in prayer, that is rooted in God, that trusts in his power, that submits to his will. And Jesus will demonstrate this type of prayer in just a couple of chapters in Mark chapter 14 when he's in the Garden of Gethsemane. Just moments from his arrest and he's praying to the Father. And Jesus is going to say in Mark 14, 36, Father, all things are possible for you, with you, just like he's talking about right here. Then he says, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. I don't, I don't want to go to the cross but not my will be done, but yours. Do you pray that way? Do I pray that way? God, I rest in you, and I trust in you, and I trust that you can do marvelous things. Help me to rest in your will. Help me to surrender to your will as I seek to be your hands and your feet. The temple was to be a house of prayer, a place where one displays a faith that trusts in God, submits to his will, seeks forgiveness and seeks to be forgiven. And yet it was this empty tree, leaves with no fruit. 
What do, what do we do with this this morning? Right? Like, how do we apply this today? In light of, we're, we're going to move into communion in just a little bit. Like, how, how do I think about this passage and how it applies to me? I want to give us a few things, a few questions for us to ponder and even sit in some self-reflection here in just a moment. These are questions that, like, I've been wrestling with all week and continuing to wrestle with that I want to just encourage you to take some time to sit and think about some of these, maybe pray on some of these before we take communion. Maybe take your camera out and take a picture so you can look at some of these later on during the week, maybe take some notes. It's a couple of questions as I think about this text that have been just challenging my heart this week that I want to invite you into to encourage you to let God work in your heart a bit too, right? First, are there, are there areas in my life that I need to repent because I'm bearing leaves but no fruit? Areas in my life where I, I'm showing good religious performance but my heart is just not where God needs it. Is there, number two, am I going through the motions? Am I busy with religious work but my heart is hardened or indifferent to God? Number three, where do I need to repent of my desire to be more focused on doing things for God than resting and moving in obedience to God? Where do I need to repent that I'm more focused on doing for God than resting in who he is and walking in obedience to him? Here's number four, and this is the one I've been like wrestling with the most this week. Who do I exclude from hearing God's word because of religion? Here's the last one. How do I need to pray for myself and others in light of the reality that Jesus is both Savior and Judge? I want to invite you, before we transition to our communion table, to just take a few moments. If there's one of those questions that's just kind of hitting you right now, take some time to reflect, to pray, to repent. Join me in just a moment of silent reflection.